Buenos días a todos. Bueno, ya sabéis que hoy tenemos una, una charla de, de un investigador de, de un reconocido prestigio. Eh, desafortunadamente estas palabras están ahora mismo en bastante desuso, pero en el caso de, de Mauricio tiene un currículum completamente extraordinario. Ha trabajado en, en ATT durante mucho tiempo, en los últimos tiempos ha estado trabajando en, en Amazon y bueno, probablemente sea una de las personas quizás con más influencia en el mundo de, de la optimización heurística, que bueno, que tenemos el placer de haberle disfrutado aquí durante tres semanas. Hoy va a hablar de una de esas partes quizá eh, más complejas que tenemos en la, en la universidad, que tiene que ver fundamentalmente con, con cómo, cómo colaborar con la empresa privada. Esa, esa, esa colaboración no es tan sencilla como a priori uno podría pensar. Eh, desafortunadamente, pues bueno, eh, de forma completamente fortuita, estaba antes hablando con, con Antonio Alonso en el despacho de lo complicado que es ¿no? eh, colaborar con la empresa privada, probablemente porque la empresa privada prefiera contratar directamente el talento y no esa colaboración directamente con la, con la universidad. Es verdad que Estados Unidos es distinto, es verdad que Estados Unidos tiene una forma distinta de, de, de afrontar las cosas, pero bueno, creo que de alguna forma puede ser muy relevante que nos diga cómo esos 30, 40 años de trayectoria profesional pues bueno, de alguna forma ha sido capaz de enriquecerse en esa colaboración público-privada que tanto requeríamos por aquí. Cuando quieras, Mauricio, adelante. Muchas gracias. Yeah, so let me begin by uh, taking a picture of us. <laughs> That always must be good. So, uh, so, uh, So as Abraham mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, my 40 year uh, career uh, in, uh, in both industry and university and the collaboration between uh, both of them. Uh, so before I start, let me thank uh, Abraham, uh, Gemma and Eduardo, as well as the computer science department here for the kind invitation. Um, And this is the second time I come to this university and I've enjoyed myself both times. So I hope to come back again uh, soon. <laughs> uh, okay, so one may ask, uh, you know, usually one thinks of university and, and, and industry as being separate entities, but in fact, uh, they, they have some attraction. Uh, so uh, why, would, uh, why would industry attract people in academia? Well, one thing is that, uh, Uh, usually in academia, you, you work on uh, sort of abstract problems and uh, contrived problems, uh, not real problems. And so uh, usually academicians think of industry as having a source of real problems. And so that would be one big attraction for, for academicians is to find real problems to work, to work with. Uh, and, and, and if you work on real problems and they have an impact, you can generate patents, which is something that usually in academia is harder to do and in industry it's e easier to do. Uh, and being a source of real problems, uh, uh, you can imagine that uh, one can find real data in, in, in industry. And so if you want to solve problems using real data, you may, you may be attracted uh, by, uh, by industry uh, to make some context. And there are many other resources uh, that industry has uh, which may interest academia. And among them, uh, human talent, for example, uh, computational libraries, et cetera. Um, now, why would a university attract an industrial researcher? Well, one thing is that, you know, in, uh, universities are producing uh, PhD students and, and graduating master's students and everything. And so it's a renewable source of human talent. So they're always being produced and you can go there and and see if you can fetch some of them and recruit them. Uh, also in universities, since people have more freedom to think about new things and they can uh, brew some new ideas uh, that in industry where they have more the, you know, they have to make a profit and they have to show impact. Uh, they may not have time to think about these new ideas where you do in university. And so uh, that, that would be also something that would attract an industrial researcher in a university is are these new ideas. So uh, my journey started actually before the 1980s. So I've been around uh, for a while. Uh, so, so in the 70s, actually, I went to college and I studied electrical engineering. And when I finished, I got a master's at Georgia Tech in, in the operations research. And then went back to Brazil for uh, three years. I worked in the operations research team 
in a big power company, uh, Furnas, Centrais Electricas. And, uh, and, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about that time, even though we did have uh, interaction with universities back then. But I'll start uh, my journey uh, when I was a PhD student at Berkeley, uh, uh, the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, my PhD thesis was on scheduling of uh, semiconductor fabrication. So this is a manufacturing problem. And, uh, and, and soon we realized that, you know, to actually solve the real problem and make impact, we'd have to see what the real problem was. And my advisors then suggested that I do an internship at Fairchild Semiconductor. Fairchild was one of the first, if not the first company to actually device semiconductor devices. And uh, they're located in Palo Alto, which is about one hour drive from Berkeley. And so I went, I went, I spent a summer at Fairchild, learned about the process, visited the fabrication units where you have to put the, the, the white clothes, which is a clean, clean room. And, uh, and at the end of, the, of my internship, they liked the, my work, but which was basically focused on writing a simulator for, for the factory. Uh, that they hired me as a consultant for the next two years. And I would go once a week, every Friday, I would drive down to Palo Alto and work with them. At the same time, uh, I started collaborating with uh, Narendra Karmakar uh, uh, in linear, linear programming. So Narendra uh, was at at and Bell Labs in New Jersey. Um, so, uh, so let me talk, tell you a little bit about the story with Karmakar. So uh, basically in 1983, uh, Karmakar proposed in a tech report a uh, new polynomial time algorithm for linear programming. And at that time, uh, that wasn't such a, such a great thing because in 1979, Leonid Kachin had already proposed the ellipsoid method, which was also a polynomial time algorithm. So we, we knew that linear programming was pop, or could be solved in polynomial time. Uh, uh, but what really made an impact was in 1984, that Karmakar went around giving talks and he uh, claimed that his algorithm was 100 times faster than the simplex method. And until then, simplex method was the, was the algorithm to, to use to solve uh, linear programs. Uh, but, you know, Karmakar said that he called simplex method like a trial and error method because it's, you know, you have, you're at a point and then you, you can go to many points. Some of them may be better than the others, so it's sort of trial and error. Uh, so that, that was a big claim because uh, now you had a polynomial time algorithm, but that you could actually implement in practice. Uh, so, uh, so in the first semester of 1985, uh, our professor, uh, Elon Adler, Elon, by the way, was a former PhD student of, of uh, George Danzig, who invented the simplex method. And uh, he said, oh, let's learn about this because now, you know, something that can be implemented and it's a hundred times faster than the simplex method. Uh, so we decided to, uh, he decided to put together a class just to study the tech report and the paper. And these are very difficult papers to read. And so we took a whole semester uh, working on this, the whole class to be able to get through the paper and actually sort of understand what the, because there's a whole new approach of looking at uh, uh, it's just coming mainly from nonlinear programming. And, uh, and so I attended this class and we learned. And during the class, I actually implemented uh, some of the algorithms that were there using a language called APL. I don't know if you guys are familiar with APL. It's a lang language from the 80s and uh, even earlier that, that has primitive operations for matrices. So one of the big up, one of the most difficult things to do in an interior point method is to solve a least squares problem to calculate the direction that you're going to move. And that's just one line in APL. So we can implement the algorithms, not, not very efficiently, but, uh, but just to see if it actually worked. And, and, uh, and during the, that class, uh, I saw that, you know, I implemented the algorithm. And at the same time, I took my qualifying exam. And the qualifying exam in Berkeley, usually what they do is that they give you one month before the exam, they give you a paper that supposedly you hadn't, you hadn't seen before. And, uh, and you, have to, you have a month to prepare that paper and then you present the paper. And the paper I got was a paper uh, that for the first time showed how to derive dual variables in, in interior point methods. Uh, so Todd and Burrell were the authors of that paper. 
And so in, in my presentation, I actually gave examples using the implementation that I did and the, and the, the, the people who were examining really liked it and I passed my exam. Uh, okay, so, so that was in the first semester of 85. And then in the summer of 85, uh, Karmakar, uh, she had been making these claims of 100 times faster, but he couldn't, he couldn't give evidence, uh, you know, show details of how it was 100 times faster. So he, because um, AT&T was not letting him, they wanted to commercialize this, this thing and, uh, and they weren't letting him give details. But he managed to convince them that he could, he could find a university uh, partners to team up with him and actually do an implementation of the algorithm and then be able to describe it in the open liter literature. And so um, it came, uh, he came to Berkeley to spend a semester at the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute there. And, uh, and then in the second semester of that year, Elon Adler again took his class and decided let's, let's get together with Karmakar and have the whole class do a class project where we implement the algorithm. And so I was in that class too, and, and I was involved in the, the most central part of the algorithm, which was solving this least squares problem. Uh, and so we ended up uh, implementing what's now known as the dual affine scaling algorithm, uh, which is not polynomial time, by, by the way, but, it, but, it, but it's an interior point algorithm and, it, and, it, and it's faster than the, than the simplex method. Uh, so, so we, by the end of the year, we almost had a working implementation. So we had all the parts, each student was doing a different part and we put things together. It wasn't quite working yet, but over the winter break, uh, we actually got it to work. And then we saw that indeed we could solve linear programs faster than, than the simplex method. So finally in April of 1986 uh, in Los Angeles, we presented the first algorithm for linear program that was faster than the simplex method. And that was a big, uh, big splash. Lots of attention, room was filled, you know, 500 people. And it was, it was really, really a big thing. So that was very exciting times. Uh, and that resulted in these two papers. So we have one paper in math programming, uh, which was implementation of Karma Car's algorithm where we show the algorithm, uh, we show the computational results and then uh, this paper showed all the tricks and secrets of how you, you go about doing an efficient implementation. Until then, many people had tried to implement these algorithms, but they all failed. And the main reason they failed is that they didn't know how to, to actually solve this least squares problem. There's some special characteristics in there. That, so in this paper, we actually described, this is what's now known as Inform's Journal of Computing, before it was ARSA Journal of Computing. So those are the two papers uh, that came out. So this is work done during my PhD. It was not related to my PhD thesis. Uh, then uh, during my last year uh, uh, in Berkeley, uh, uh, Karmakar, I, Karmakar knew that I was graduating and then he invited me to join, to join Bell Labs. Uh, and that was a big break for me because it was a super opportunity. And, uh, and I told them that, well, I couldn't go immediately to Bell Labs because my wife was still finishing her PhD, you know, at Berkeley, but she would finish in about a year and then in, in about a year I could go. So what they did is that they hired me uh, to work in a, as a consultant in a division uh, of at and that was actually uh, trying to commercialize this idea. So it's the it's Advanced Decision Support Systems, ADSS. And, and while I was in Berkeley, they set up a computer for me. Uh, and, remind, and, and mind you that this is in the, in the 80s. So they actually put a mini computer in my house and I could uh, log in and work from home uh, during that whole year. Once a month, I would go to New, New Jersey and spend, spend a week with the guys there. Uh, and so the year went by and in 1988, I was hired uh, by uh, the research division, so-called Area 11 that they call it there, of Bell Labs to work at the Mathematical Sciences Research Center in Murray Hill, New Jersey. And, uh, and the mathematical science, and the department that I worked in was the Mathematical Foundations of Computing Department, uh, which was headed by David Johnson. Uh, and, the, and the center was headed by, by Mike Gary. So that's the Gary and Johnson book, or the, those are the two guys that were, in, that were involved in this department. And it was a bit intimidating work to work there because it had a lot of big stars there like Johnson, Tarjan, Peter Shore, uh, Karmakar, Ed Kaufman, and so on. 
So, it was, so you know, when I had to do my first presentations and everything, it was very, very intimidating. But anyway, it was a risky thing, and I took the risk, and it was, and it paid, paid off. Uh, so, this is a photo of uh, of all the researchers in mathematics and computer science at Bell Labs in nineteen in 19, uh, 1995. Uh, and uh, I'm one of these guys here. And specifically, here I am. <laughs> And this was before my hair started turning white. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, this is John Bentley, for example, who does the you know, programming pearls, and lots of really famous people in this in this photo. And so uh, the, the, that was the team that we were working on. Uh, <clears throat> so Bell Labs was a is a is a really interesting place to work, uh, and it's uh, and and it's the it's really where innovation happens. Because nowadays people talk about innovation, but innovation is like an app. Uh, here they they really did innovation. Many of the things that we use in, in the modern life today were invented there. And this is a great book to read about it because it goes it goes through the, the Bell Labs since uh, since its founding in 1925. Um, so what was uh, what was research uh, like at Bell Labs? Well, first there was a research culture. You know, Bell Labs was was done for researchers, and and they wanted to bring together uh, because it, initially Bell Labs belonged it was AT and T. AT and T was a monopoly, and they had, it was the only tele, telecommunications company in the United States. And they sort of because of there were this monopoly, they they funded this research, uh, and 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 so we had a a really big research division. We had a thousand six hundred researchers. In the research division, and half of them, about half of them, were, were physicists, and the other half were mathematicians and computer scientists. And uh, and this is just a partial list of the things that were invented there. But you know, transistor, data networks, information theory, cellular telephony, solar cells, laser, digital transmission of voice, satellite communications, digital signal processing. Uh, Couple charge devices that you see in your cameras: MP3, uh, Unix, uh, AUX, C, C++, TRUF, which came before LaTeX. My thesis I wrote in TRUF, by the way. So, uh, statistical quality control, the S language, which is the precursor of the R language. Uh, Ample, for those of you who model stuff in uh, math programming. Uh, deep neural networks uh, support vector machine, and so on. Uh, and to, to your point, algorithms. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, research there was 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 working there was more was very like a university in the sense that uh, people had freedom of doing research. You could research anything you wanted. No one told you you're going to have to do work in this area. You can. We had people that were working on ecology, uh, how animals can migrate in Africa, for example. Uh, we we could publish our work anywhere, and in fact, that was one of the main the main goal was uh, pub, pub, publication of uh, papers and so on. Uh, we could also work from home, and that's, that's sort of a new concept. But back then, we were right when I started, we already, I already had a connection. Uh, of course, it wasn't with graphics, but it had a connection, ISDN connection, to work. And I had a, a terminal always on with my email uh, at home. Uh, uh, also, you know, AT the Bell Labs competed for talent with Berkeley, Stanford, MIT. So the really good, the really good students who graduated and had the opportunity to go to Berkeley, Stanford, MIT, uh, often would come to work at Bell Labs. Uh, we didn't have any classes. Like in university, you have classes. We had very few meetings. The only meeting we really had was a lunch that we had uh, every day. We call it theory lunch because it's mainly people who worked in computer theory, uh, computer science theory. Uh, and we had a lot of money, so there was a lot of funding for equipment. Uh, when I joined, I had a, an Alien uh, 8 processor computer only for, for, for me to work on. So it was, a, <laughs> it was really great. Uh, we had money for travel. We had money for visitors. So we had visitors. We had, of course, summer interns, but we had also visiting PhD students. Uh, we had also uh, visiting postdoctoral fellows, uh, and also we had what we call academic consultants, where, where we could hire a professor uh, to come work with us 
and we would actually have money to pay them while, while they were working with us. And they would come. So I had several of them who would come and, and spend like 10 days a year. And, and, and that could be broken down into several trips, like several three-day trips, for example. Uh, and the labs also produce a lot of Nobel Prizes. So here's a picture of me with one of the Nobel Prize winners, Bob Wilson, who got a Nobel Prize in physics in 1978 for discovering the first evidence of the Big Bang, so it was the back background radiation. And so they, the labs has earned over the years uh, 15 Nobel Prizes, 14 of them in physics, and one in chemistry for things like transistor, matter wave duality, Big Bang, CCD, and so on. Um, for those of you who are computer scientists, the labs also had a lot of uh, Turing winners, Turing award winners. Uh, among them, uh, Richard Hamming, you know the Hamming distance, uh, uh, Dennis Mitchell, uh, Richie and uh, Kenneth Thompson for, for Unix, uh, Tarzan, they did instructions and analysis of algorithms, uh, Jan LeCun for uh, deep, deep neural networks. Uh, Jan used to work at Bell Labs before he went to Facebook. Uh, and uh, Aho and Ullman for uh, uh, data, uh, programming languages and, and algorithms. Uh, so when I joined uh, Bell Labs, uh, David Johnson advised me to try to attend as many conferences as possible. Uh, at least in the first 10 years of my career, uh, because it said it was important for you to be able to, people to associate your name with your face. And the way to do it is show up at conferences, meet people. And so, uh, so I followed his advice and he had been doing this. So David, for the, for the 40 years that he worked at at and he had never missed a single stock or Fox uh, uh, conference. So there are 40 of them. So I started collaborating with people from a number of different universities also, among them Berkeley, Austin, Texas, Florida, lots of them in, in Europe, and including uh, here, uh, here at your university. Uh, so uh, so in, the, in, the, in the late 1980s, while I was at Bell Labs, I collaborated with people uh, uh, for doing uh, interior point algorithms with GRASP, uh, I met Fred Glover, uh, specialized in zero point algorithms for network flows, and started working with Ponos Pardalos on quadratic assignment problems. And um, so, uh, so we'll tell the story about GRASP then. Uh, so when when I was uh, between eighty seven and eighty eight, so I had already graduated from from Berkeley, uh, and I was I was this consultant at AT and T at DSS. Uh, uh, what happened is that Tom Feo and I, we were colleagues during our PhD in Berkeley. And, uh, uh, and Tom graduated a year before I did. And so uh, after graduating, he was hired by University of Texas in Austin as an assistant professor. And during the, that year, uh, he knew I was, had been working in interior point algorithms. And uh, he tried to recruit me to go to be a professor in his department at University of Texas. So during that year, I traveled several times to Austin uh, to do interviews uh, in the department. And, uh, and during my interviews, I first gave a talk on uh, implementation of interior point algorithms, which was quite interesting because there was this guy, uh, Abe Sharns, who was one of the fam famous guys. There's Sharns and Cooper. They had, they had a lot, lot of papers in the, in the past, in the, the old days. And uh, Sharns was there, and they, they warned me, be careful with Sharns, he's going to ask a lot of tough questions. <laughs> and uh, so he did ask a lot of questions, but I managed to answer them. And he, and at the end, he came to me and said, ah, now I understand. The important thing here is the, how you implement the algorithm. So <laughs> I said, yes, that's right. And so, uh, and then, uh, then they wanted me to also talk about my PhD thesis, which at the time I wasn't giving much importance to, except that it will lead me to a PhD. Uh, but I, uh, so I gave a talk and I think that was the only talk I ever gave about my talk and my PhD thesis was when I did the interview in this place. Uh, even though the paper we wrote uh, has a lot of citations, over 500 citations over the year and it's been used in a lot of situations. But yeah, so, so when, when one of these visits, uh, Tom Feo and I uh, decided to work uh, on a problem, uh, a difficult set covering problem 
which I had been working with Karma Car. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we said, maybe we can try a, a different approach. And we came up with this, what we call the probabilistic heuristic. Uh, and the probabilistic heuristic was, it was precisely grasp. So it was a, it was a semi-greedy algorithm. So it was a greedy algorithm with randomization followed by a simple local search. And then we showed that we could get better solutions than what we were getting with, with uh, Karma Car. Uh, and so that's how GRASP was born. Now the name GRASP wasn't given until one year later. And basically what the way the name was came up was that Tom, Tom was driving in Austin and he saw an ad in the street for a rock and roll group. They're gonna have a concert and the name of the rock and roll group was GRASP. <laughs> So it's a ah, greedy randomized adaptive search procedure. So that's how the name came up. And, uh, and so that was good. It was a catchy name. And, uh, and, uh, and, and it was just by coincidence that it was found. And, and so at the end of the day, they, they made me an offer to be a professor. But I also got another offer from Bell Labs. And then uh, for many reasons, I decided to go to Bell Labs. Uh, and so that's when I moved there in, the, in 1988. So, so I worked at Bell Labs. When I went there, I was supposed to, I, I was thinking that I'm going to work just on interior point algorithms because that's what Karma Car was working on. Uh, but, but David Johnson uh, encouraged me to pursue the meta heuristic side of the, of the picture. And so I continued working with Tom, Tom on a GRASP for maximum independence. That, that was the first paper to use the name GRASP. And it was finally published in, uh, after five years of reviews. In, uh, in 1994 in operations research. Uh, but in 1989, I presented at an INFORMS conference uh, a paper uh, on, this, uh, on, this, on, this, on this topic. Uh, so, so during that period, we, we saw that we, we did many, implement, many papers on GRASP, or this uh, probabilistic heuristic. Uh, and we saw uh, maybe we can frame this uh, as a meta heuristic. And we decided then to give a tutorial at an informed meeting in Nashville, Tennessee uh, uh, in 1991. And so we gave a nice tutorial and, uh, and, and, the, and the tutorial was a success. At the end, a lot of people came to ask questions and they were interested. And we said, oh, okay, so we should write, write a paper on this because that's the way to, to since we had so much interest. Uh, so we wrote a paper and we submitted it first to management science and then to OR, but it was rejected both times. So, so we got a bit uh, disappointed. But, uh, but finally, we, we submitted to Journal of Global Optimization, which was just starting, and, and, they, and it was accepted and, and finally published in 1995. And nowadays, that paper has over 4,100 citations in, in Google Scholar. So it's a very highly cited paper. Uh, yeah, so uh, to, to get the word out on GRASP, I had to do a lot of what I call evangelization. So I would go and write a lot of papers and talk a lot about GRASP, give talks over and over and over and over. Uh, and, uh, and then finally this, the idea started sticking. So last week I did a Google Scholar search for a greedy randomized adaptive search procedure, and I got uh, almost 11,000 uh, hits. So lot, lots of papers either about GRASP or mentioning GRASP. And finally, we, we decided to write, write a book on this. And this was like a five-year project. And, uh, and we published this book in 2016. And this is with a colleague, Celso Hiber. And Celso, I had been working with Celso on GRASP since 1994. Uh, we met also at a conference. Uh, uh, and then decided let's work together, and we did a grasp for graph planarization. That was the first first thing that we worked on. So then, in the in the two thousands, uh, I kept working at AT and T. Uh, so first uh, until nineteen ninety six, I worked at AT and T Bell Labs, and after that at AT and T Labs Research. Uh, essentially, in nineteen ninety six, uh, AT and T broke itself up into two companies. Lucent Technologies, which kept the name Bell Labs, and AT&T, which kept the name AT&T Labs. And all of David's team went to AT&T Labs. And so I moved there. Uh, I still worked a little bit with Tom. We, we did some work on grass for satisfiability. Continued working with Geraldo. 
uh, and recruited him to work at Bell Labs. Uh, so we worked on uh, net network flow algorithms. And then, and in 1993, I started a collaboration with some guys in Portugal. So Luis Portugal and Joaquin Juiz at Coimbra. And it turned out that Luis was doing a PhD with Joaquin and uh, he, he basically was working on the same algorithm that we were working on. But he, uh, when he <laughs> presented it once, someone said, oh, Mauricio has been working on that for a few years. And so he was, oh my goodness, my, my thesis is going down the drain. So, so he said, uh, let's get to, so we, I proposed to him, let's get together. Maybe we can do something uh, to advance this, this in a different direction. And so we got together uh, and we actually did some, uh, some, some nice al uh, algorithms for network flows. Uh, I continued working with Panos. By the way, Panos is my top, uh, top co-author. We have over 50 papers together. And, uh, and, and, I'm, and, and Fred, who I had met in, uh, in Texas, invited me to be part of the inaugural editorial board of Journal of Heuristics. And in the number one issue, uh, I was invited to take part in the paper that we wrote on on how to write, how to do experiments with, with heuristics and reporting experiments with heuristics. So that was a nice paper that I, I took part in. And in 1999, I attended my first MIC uh, that was in Brazil. And, uh, uh, and so uh, also in the 90s, I started a role as, as academic advisor. And that's when I was at at and So I had, I had, of course, interns. I had the short-term visitors. Uh, I was in a lot of uh, defense, thesis defense boards and committees. Uh, uh, I, I was advising master's students and PhD students and also postdoc visitors. Uh, so the, uh, yeah, so here's a photo of Luis Portugal uh, in Coimbra, very, very nice university. Uh, and this is the math department. Uh, and here we are. Uh, in around 1993, 1994. And we worked together until 1998. Unfortunately, in 1997, Luis was diagnosed with lymphoma and he came to die in one, one year later. So, And it was unfortunate because uh, he passed away before he finished his PhD thesis. But we we managed to get uh, several papers out and the most important ones were, were these two, the truncated primal infeasible, dual feasible network interior point method and the study of preconditioners for metric interior point over methods. Where here we explain wh why uh, this algorithm works so well. So it uses precondition con conjugate gradients to compute the, 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 the least squares problem and, and the condition number of this, of this, of this matrix uh, as it goes, as you're solving the problem, you're going to the optimal, it converges to one. So you're basically solving just a few conjugate gradient iterations, you're able to solve the linear system. And so we explained that in this paper. So this was published in 2001 and this, I think 2003, yeah, 2003. Okay, and then uh, at that time also, I started attending Elavius. So Elavius is the, is, the, is, the, is the summer school that's organized by Alio. Uh, which is Latin American and Iberian OR society. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the first one I attended one was in 1995 uh, in Brazil, near Rio. Uh, and here you have a lot of people uh, who, who we now who have grown up and now they're, they're very, some of them are very famous. Uh, but uh, uh, here I am in the middle, and this is uh, Renata Yex. Uh, and Renata, uh, I met her. Uh, I met her in this uh, at this conference, and we decided uh, she she wanted to. In Brazil, they have this thing called doutorado uh, sanduíche, uh, which is sandwich uh, doctorate, where you spend a year uh, abroad uh, doing working on your research. And so she asked to, to come to work with me at at and uh, and so she. She came and she she was actually my first PhD student. So she was a student of Celso Ribeiro. Uh, so we co-advised her uh, at the Catholic University of Rio. And, uh, and she was a student in computer science. And her thesis was experimental analysis of the probability distribution of running time in grass heuristics. So it showed that grass heuristics 
have a, a running time that's exponentially distributed. Uh, and as a byproduct of, of this, of her thesis, well, she came up with these TTT plots, which are very useful for doing computational experiments. Uh, yeah, and we work, we work together. Uh, so we published this paper, she, she, she finished in 2002. And, and unfortunately also she was diagnosed with cancer uh, in, uh, in 2004 and came to die in 2006. So, uh, so that, was a, that was really a pity. Uh, but in 1999, I attended my second Elavio, and in that meeting, uh, <coughs> so there's a, some guys here that you might recognize. This guy here is uh, Martin uh, Savelsberg, uh, who's, uh, who's a big shot in, uh, in lots of these fields. Uh, but, uh, but, but I was here, and this is uh, Luciana Burial. Uh, Luciana, I met her at this at this conference, and uh, and after a, a few months, she also uh, decided that she wanted to come to AT and T to to do this the Parad sandwich, uh, and so she came to AT and T, and she spent 15 months there uh, at the Shannon Laboratory where where we worked, and and, uh, and she was a systems engineering. Uh, uh, PhD student, but did her undergraduate in computer science and her master's also in computer science. And so I co advised her with Paulo Fransa, and her thesis was on uh, internet and traffic routing on the internet. And this is, uh, was, a, was stuff done with biased random key genetic algorithms. So, uh, and after graduating, she did a postdoc in Italy and then was a professor in Brazil for 15 years. And then I recruited her to go to Amazon. So now she's, she's at Amazon. She's a principal research scientist in Seattle since uh, 2021. Uh, now a little, uh, some words about BRKJ, how, how it all started. <laughs> so uh, this is Jose Gonçalves. Just like, just like uh, Tom Feo, Jose and I were also uh, colleagues at our PhD in Berkeley. Uh, from 1983 to 1987, and we basically started this. I started one semester before he did, and we both finished in 1987. Uh, but but in, but after we graduated, we hadn't we didn't collaborate on any research uh, for many years. So until 2002 is when we actually started uh, collaborating, uh, and 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 the collaboration was basically unbiased random key genetic calls. So. He was publishing a paper uh, and he was having a hard time uh, getting the paper published. It used the decoder that just, just like Bean, that you just sort the vector and you get a permutation. Uh, and he, and, and I told him, well, maybe you should submit it to Journal of Heuristics. Maybe I can, and I asked, I asked uh, uh, Fred Glover if I could handle that paper. And I, and I helped to get that paper through and it actually got published. And I got interested in the subject, uh, and then with uh, Lucian and, and someone before her, uh, we actually did a decoder that was not sorting the, the vector. And that's how I got involved uh, with a different decoder. And we saw that this is a general method, not necessarily for permutation kind of problems like what Bean had proposed, but for general optimization. And so, so uh, by 2010, we had already published nine papers uh, on this topic. Just with just Jose and I had published in that nine papers. He had published a few by himself, and I had published a few by myself. But together, we had already published nine, and that's when we decided to give a name to this to this method, uh, and that's why we call it bias random key genetic algorithm. Uh, so that was in a paper that we published in 2011 in Journal of Heuristics. And he too, but in 2017, I recruited him to go to, to Amazon. So he came to Amazon, quit his job at the University of Porto and, uh, and became a principal research scientist. And he remained there until uh, 2022. And as a matter of fact, he and I uh, left Amazon on the same day, December 23rd. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so and, that, and then this year we began writing a book on BRKJ. So this is a book that we're going to do with Celso, my co-author for the Grass book. And then I met these guys here, <laughs> who you know, 
so uh, uh, I, I saw Rafa in 2001, but just he was he went to the MIC in Porto for just for one day, I think, because I saw him and then I didn't see him anymore. And so I didn't get a chance to talk to him. And then he didn't go to the next one, which was in Kyoto in Japan, and then the following one in Vienna. And so he finally went to to MIC 2007 in Montreal, Canada. And so uh, there we met, and then we we decided to work together. And uh, and he and uh, and Abraham uh, started coming to visit to visit me in uh, at AT and T starting in 2008. So this picture we took in 2008. Uh, and that resulted in seven papers, and in and, and 2018 we we uh, edited this handbook of heuristics, and and perhaps more most important, we got a patent also maximizing the diversity and subset of elements using grass with path linking. Uh, so that was one of the the things that uh, they were able to get from our collaboration was get get this patent. Uh, I've also collaborated with some other people in Spain. Uh, with Elena Hamarinu uh, from Poto Fabra, uh, we did a we did a, a BRKGA for picking up blood samples uh, when people do blood blood tests, and you have to take it back to a central lab. Uh, so it's a capacitated vehicle routing problem with with maximum uh, truck travel time. And then I did also a, a, a paper with Elena uh, Fernandez. Uh, well, I'm a student of hers uh, um, on a, a BRKJ also for uh, capacitated minimum spanning tree. So we got those papers published. Uh, and I continued going to our conferences. So this one was in Lima, Peru. And, uh, and there, uh, myself and, and Jose Luis Gonzalez de Laje were invited speakers. And uh, and so we walked around the city a lot and talked about different things. And I talked, told them about, you know, had all these PhD students who were coming to visit me and, and maybe did he, did he have a good PhD student? He said, yeah, in fact, I do have a good PhD student. And, and that was uh, uh, Luis Fernando Moran Mirabo. Uh, and he spent uh, about a year with me there at at and uh, finally defended uh, in 20. In 2013, he defended uh, his thesis on automatic tuning of grass with evolutionary path linking using a bias right random right key genetic algorithm. Um, so finally, I went to the, this is the last Alavia that I've been to so far. And that was also in Brazil. And this was organized by Luciana. Uh, and, and in this, and in this, in this Alavia, I met, I met two PhD students who then came to visit me. Uh, and the first one was uh, uh, Carlos Eduardo de Andrade, who was a PhD student in computer science at Unicamp in Brazil. And so we, I co-advised him with Flavio Miwazawa, and, and he worked on evolutionary algorithms for problems in telecom. And when, um, when he finished his uh, thesis, he, he actually did a postdoc with Nemhauser at Georgia Tech, and then got a position at at and Labs Research, uh, where he is now a principal inventive scientist. And, and Carlos and I have seven papers uh, written together. Almost, I think all of them on biased random key genetic algorithms. And the other guy was, uh, was Fernando Stefanello, who was a PhD student of Luciana. And so, this, so Fernando is my, is my academic grandson because <laughs> Luciana was my academic daughter. And so he's an academic grandson. And he and he, uh, he his PhD was in heuristics for network uh, for problems, and he currently works at a at a startup uh, in Brazil. And we wrote three papers together. Um, and so I I still advise other students. So I advised one in Argentina, uh, remotely. So he didn't come to ATT, uh, but I advised uh, five students of Celso without being an official advisor. So. And another five students besides uh, uh, Renata. And so remotely, I advise Susana Canuto, a master's student who now works at Microsoft in Seattle, and Simone Martins, who is now a professor in Brazil. Uh, also advised students who visited me 
uh, at at and Thiago Noronha, Luciana Pessoa, and Juliana Brandão. All three are professors in Brazil. Uh, I also advise Paula Festa from University of Napoli. Uh, she's a full, full professor in Napoli now. Uh, and I also advise many students of PANA. So Young Lee works in Wall Street. Martin Erickson, who is the first person that I did a BRKGA with. Uh, uh, Carlos Oliveira, uh, who worked at Amazon and works now at at and Michael Hirsch uh, has his own consulting company. And Claudio Menezes is a pro professor in Brazil. Uh, with these two guys here, we did what's called continuous grasp, which was extending grasp to solve continuous optimization problems. So uh, David Johnson was my manager at Bell Labs and at and Labs Research for 25 years. Uh, so at, at Bell Labs, he was the head of the Mathematical Foundations of Computing Department. And then uh, at at and Labs, he was the head of Algorithms and Optimization Research Department. And so it was really good to have to work with him because he, his office was right next door to me. It was always open and we could always chat and, and he was... He was involved in a lot of uh, in a lot of research, so he's a he's a manager, but actually who actually programmed from uh, into into his uh, late 60s. Uh, uh, and David uh, in 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 20, 2015 or so was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer, and and so we were working on this paper uh, since two thousand and eight. And, and I remember that right before he went to hospital to get surgery, he's, he sent me an email telling me not to tell the other authors, but he was going to leave all the files with me just in case. And, and it was uh, interesting that, uh, that uh, then he never touched the paper anymore because it had some complications in, in the surgery, and then he died in uh, 2016. But, but I took over the paper and actually pushed it through, and then in... Uh, 2021, we got this paper published in Operations Research. And we, we put him as the first author, uh, David Johnson. So this is a bunch of people. Uh, all of them had worked at at and and most of them are not, not working at at anymore. <clears throat> so, so, you know, such a nice place to work. Why, why would I want to leave uh, at and uh, That's a good question to ask. Let me show a little bit of history. So uh, AT&T was a monopoly until 1984. And as a monopoly, it had one lab, which was Bell Labs. In 1984, the US government forced AT&T to break up. And so it broke up into one long distance company called AT&T and seven uh, small companies known as Baby Bells. Uh, and each one was a monopoly for local telephony in different parts of the United States. And so uh, between uh, 1984 and 1996, uh, there were these. There was the AT&T, which had AT&T Bell Labs, and then the Baby Bells had their laboratories called Bellcore. And they went on until until finally there was a, there was this dot com bust. You know, dot com people were investing in uh, internet stuff and uh, all these companies, and all of a sudden, 2001. Uh, it just burst, and then uh, a lot of companies, uh, including at and and uh, were got into a lot, lot of trouble. And uh, and so uh, in in uh, 1996, at t decided then to break itself apart uh, vol voluntarily now, and it and it and it became uh, Lucent, which kept the name Bell Labs because Lucent was going to do systems. Uh, and at t was going to do service. And so systems, Bell Labs' name was more connected to systems and, and, and equipment and devices. And, and they kept the Bell Labs name. Uh, since then, it's been bought by Alcatel, and now it's a Nokia. So no Nokia is the Bell Labs is Nokia Bell Labs. Uh, but it's, not, it's, a long, it's no longer the big thing that it used to be. Uh, but at and Labs continues still, and then Belcor became, became Telcordia. Uh, so this kept going until finally, you know, at and was saying that it's, it's not doing so well, uh, and it should be acquired. It tried to acquire uh, SBC, but the government did, didn't let it, said it because of uh, monopoly. They, but then a few years later, SBC acquired at and <laughs> AT&T shrunk itself so that it will look uh, 
It would look interesting. And then uh, SBC bought it. And that was in 2006. Uh, and, and that had a big influence on why I left, why I left at and So uh, wh why did I leave? Well, one, it all started with the dot-com burst. So it affected the entire te telecom industry. And a, a big event that happened was in, in February of 2002. You know, they wanted to, they wanted to cut costs. And, and, and somehow someone there said, oh, let's focus on research. Uh, and so they, we had 600 researchers at the time in at and Labs Research. And in one day, they fired 400 of them. So they were all laid off. And so we went from 600 to 200 in one shot. So, so then a lot of people saw that, uh, you know, we're working at this place that seems like a university and universities have tenure, but here people didn't have tenure, so you could be fired. And a lot of people realized that. So between 2002 and 2006, uh, there were numerous voluntary departures from the labs. People went to university where they would have tenure. So we had people going to MIT, to, to Cornell, to Johns Hopkins and so on, Michigan. And so on, and uh, and 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 so the number of, of employees at AT&T from 2002 to 2006 went from 175,000 to about 40,000. Every week they had they were firing people, so usually it was on Fridays <laughs> they would send they would send the notice, and it was it was a very stressful period to work there. So in 2006, SBC finally acquires AT&T and then they changed their name back to AT&T. So SBC doesn't exist anymore, it's called AT&T. Uh, but the layoffs continue uh, because SBC being a, a local monopoly, they were very concerned, also from Texas, they're a very conservative company. They didn't care very much about research and I think that's a luxury to do. And, and so they, they kept on firing people and so they laid off in waves and they fired a lot of really famous people from the National Academy of Sciences and everything uh, were fired. And finally, in 2013, uh, they closed down David Johnson's department. And, they, and the 10 people who were working there, they, they sent uh, to different departments. I went to something called the Network Evolution uh, Department, Net Network Evolution Research Department. And, and, and that same year, they laid off David Johnson. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, that's after he was working there for 40 years. And he really liked, uh, he liked so much working there that even when he was on vacation, he would go have lunch <laughs> at the theory, theory lunch with us. So he was, he was, and so I remember that his last day, we were working that paper. And, you know, we, we had to, he had to give back his computer at 6 o'clock in the afternoon. And we were working until you know 5:55, and then I got the, the files, and uh, and then he finally gave the computer back. Uh, so by 2014, David Applegate and myself were the last two people from David's uh, team that were still at AT&T, and I didn't want to be the last one uh, to leave. So, so I in in December of 2014, I moved to uh, I moved to Seattle to work at Amazon. And, and, and two years later, Applegate interviewed in, uh, at Amazon, but decided to go to, to Google. So he works at Google in New York. By the way, in Google, there are more than, at that time, there were more than 80 former at and Labs people working there, including the head of Google research. There's a Corina Cortez who, who worked at, uh, she worked in machine learning at the, at at and um, so, so what was it to work at Amazon? So at Amazon it was quite different from uh, from AT and T. First of all, Amazon, you know, they had a lot of problems that had to be solved, and they were looking to make money and, and, and make things improve. So I was hired as a as a research scientist in the modeling and optimization group. It's like an OR group, and it was headed by it is still headed by Russell Albert. He's Amazon's chief scientist. He was also Amazon's first scientist to be hired. It was hired in 2001. Uh, and together with me, uh, MOP hired also Renato Vernacchi and, uh, and Andrew Goldberg. And they both worked at Microsoft Research in, in Palo Alto. Uh, and it, that had shut down in September of 2014. And, uh, and they let off the whole staff. And so, the, so they, uh, they were looking for work. And uh, uh, they, Renato saw that I was 
I was I was going to start at the <clears throat> Amazon, so we exchanged uh, we exchanged some uh, communication, and finally uh, they interviewed, and they both got hired uh, at Mop. Um, and so after I started, uh, I decided I was going to advise a PhD student at the University of Washington, Larissa Petroiano. And, and to do that, I had to become an affiliate professor. So I applied for that affiliate professor position and I got it. And then I advised her uh, until she defended her thesis in, in uh, 2020. And, uh, and I co-advised Larissa with uh, Zalda Zabinski. Uh, and, and that was in industrial and systems engineering. Uh, and she worked on exact and heuristic methods for problems in middle and last mile logistics because she was an intern with me at, a, at Amazon for two summers. And after when she finished her PhD, uh, I hired her at Amazon uh, and she worked there for another three years and, uh, and another two, two years. And now she's working at another e-commerce company, uh, Walgreens. So, uh, so, you know, the difference basically is that research at at and had a 100 year tradition where, you know, Bell Labs was founded in 1925. Uh, Amazon is a much newer company. They were founded in 1994. And, and only in 2001 did they hire their first scientists. So, uh, but it was growing a lot. So when I, when I was hired at Amazon, Amazon had 154,000 employees and had fewer than 200 scientists. Okay. Uh, eight years later, when I left, Amazon had 1.6 million employees and had over 9,000 scientists. And so people were doing research in all these areas, you know, logistics and devices, robotics, cloud, computational ads, machine learning, and so on. Uh, and, and to be able to grow at this rate, they had to have a lot of collaboration with universities. So Amazon started doing lots of uh, uh, collaboration in terms of offering internships, so we have a, uh, Amazon has a big internship program. Last year when I was there, my last uh, summer, we had uh, about 9,000 interns in, in, in all of Amazon. And uh, I, I had an intern every year that I was in Amazon, all the eight years. Uh, and most of the interns, it's like a, it's like a long interview. Uh, so you do the internship and at the end, uh, you get to, a group gets together and decides that they're going to make me an offer. And all of my interns got, got offers from Amazon. Um, and then many of them accepted some, some went to university instead. So uh, Amazon does a lot of recruiting at universities. So uh, we organize uh, events at universities to recruit. Uh, there's, there's, they have this money that they give away uh, called Amazon Research Grants which are $80,000 and it covers uh, research done by PhD students and postdocs at the university. And so they have a round every year, they have a round that you can apply uh, and, uh, and, and you, can, you can try to get one of these, one of these funds in, in these areas. Uh, and they have a very important thing, which is the Amazon Scholar Program, which is uh, basically you get uh, more senior professors to come and spend uh, a period of time uh, working at Amazon, and I'll, I'll say a few words about that. Uh, we have also something for more junior professors called Amazon Academic, Visiting Academics. And they still have uh, undergraduate fellowships for undergraduate students in computer science, and they have a new postdoc program. Uh, so the Amazon Scholar, uh, which is an opportunity for academic researchers to visit Amazon for a short period of time, uh, usually that goes from three months to two years, and it can be full-time or part-time. Uh, uh, and, it's, and it's basically to work on an applied project uh, in these areas, okay? And, and there are many, many areas. Recently, we had one working on sustainability, for example. Uh, but, but in fact, one of the reasons why they have the Amazon Scholar Program is for recruiting. Usually a, a more senior professor uh, would be difficult for them to leave university and go work in, in, a, in, a, in a risky place like Amazon. And, and the way that they, they discover that's, that they can convince people is to have them come and work on and work there for a period of time 
making the Amazon salary, which is a big incentive for, for people to come to come and then uh, and and then see what happens if they really like it and if they'll they'll stay there. And so I that's how I recruited Luciana. Uh, Luciana was an Amazon scholar for three months, starting in December of 2019. And and originally she wasn't planning on moving to Amazon. She wanted to just to experiment this, uh, experience these three months there to see what it was like. But within six months, she, she told me that, no, that she, she's decided that she wants to leave university and, and come work at Amazon. And so she started interviewing. She didn't, she didn't, she got hired, but she didn't get hired in my team. She got hired in the, in uh, Scott, which is Supply Chain Optimization Technologies, which is a big organization, has like a thousand people there, uh, and and so so now she is a full time employee at Amazon, also principal uh, research scientist. And and so Amazon also has these uh, internal meetings and conferences. People go to conferences. If you go to an Informs conference, the largest number of industry people you'll see there are people from Amazon. Uh, but they have internal meetings. Uh, we have something that we call faculty summit where we invite professors to go and uh, two two day of gone. One first day they visit the fulfillment center to see what it what it looks like. Uh, it's like the warehouses with robots and everything. And then and then after the second day people give talks about things that are going on in Amazon. So I, I've gone, I organized several of them in optimization and I went to one in machine learning. Uh, they have a big machine learning conference, uh, which is which, where people submit papers. It's, a, it's difficult to get a paper accepted there. Uh, it's a very big, uh, big event. Uh, Amazon has also something called machine learning university because a lot of people don't have training uh, in machine learning. But you know, there's a lot of jobs that require machine learning. So they have like a curriculum and you go in and you take the different courses and you come out, you can go and work in a, in a team that does machine learning. Uh, uh, we have also this research science summit, the consumer science summit which is mainly operations research uh, conference. And for the principal scientists and above and the scholars, there's offsite, offsite meetings, uh, which are two, two day events uh, where they get together. Uh, Amazon also organizes conferences for PhD students, so you can apply, and they'll pay your they'll pay your ticket and your expenses, and you go there and you present your your PhD thesis work, just uh, you know no strings attached. And so, uh, as I as I mentioned, the, the the science staff was growing until 2022, and and of course you probably read in the news that in 2023. Uh, major layoffs uh, started happening in tech, and Amazon itself uh, laid off more than 25,000 people. Uh, a lot of people I know got laid off uh, uh, there in, in, the, in the science division. Uh, Luciana is still safe, but uh, all the other people, Larissa, she was one that got fired, and lots, lots of people who worked with, even uh, Andrew Goldberg, who's a really famous guy, got, got laid off. Uh, but uh, but you know, to to maintain this growth, uh, we had to interview a lot, lot of people, and the interview process in Amazon is quite uh, quite complex. Uh, so in eight years, I interviewed more than two hundred people, and uh, and and those uh, and and the interview process begins with recruiting. You know, we're going to see who who can come to to work with us. Uh, and then once we decide that uh, this candidate may be worthwhile, we have uh, two screening interviews, either by phone or by or by video call, uh, to decide if it's worthwhile to bring the person in to to uh, to do a, a in-person interview. Uh, and so the, if there's a proof that candidate will come to Seattle or some other city like New York for an interview, and 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 in this interview they'll give a one-hour talk. On their research, and they'll have a series of five to seven interviews, each lasting one hour. So at the end, you're totally exhausted. <laughs> so you talk to people when they leave the interview, and uh, and then uh, and so this interview is done by what they call a bar raiser. Bar raiser is a position in Amazon uh, because the, what what Amazon 
it says this to be hired on Amazon, you have to raise the bar, which means you have to be you have to be better perceived as being better than 50% of the people in the same position at Amazon. So that's the and so there's this there's this position called a bar raiser who has seen many interviews and knows a lot about stuff, and he and he or she can uh, can can make that determination if it if it raises the bar, it doesn't raise the bar. Uh, so the bar raiser and the interviewers, they vote, and they vote in secret, so it's on, online, but you can't see the other person's votes until you've given your vote. Uh, you, you vote either up or down, and you vote and you, you make comments. And usually the, the way you're assigned, if you're an interviewer for science, for example, uh, you, 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 you're, you're asked to make a question either in, related to science application science uh, depth, science breadth, science uh, coding. Uh, and, and, and then, so those are the technical questions. And then they have something called the leadership principles, which is very important in Amazon. And, uh, and so each person is assigned one or two leadership principles and then they, and then they have to comment uh, uh, on each of these things that they interviewed. And then people then will, will will vote and then after the vote uh, they will they will get together and have a meeting and decide uh, it has to be a unanimous uh, result but people can change their vote during the during this meeting this it's called a debrief so they have the and and they have the pre-brief which comes before this the interview in the pre-brief we decide uh, what each person is going to ask okay and so 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 it takes a lot of energy and a lot, a lot of time. So it's, it's quite expensive to do these interviews, and and so. And then and so at the end, people you know decide if the person passes or doesn't pass, and and then if they get hired, and it's a, uh, it's sort of difficult to to get to pass there because uh, I saw many many really really good candidates who just didn't pass, and and sometimes for one uh, little reason. And, and many times related to these Amazon leadership principles, because they have questions for each of these principles. These are principles that they say that, that leaders at Amazon should have. Uh, so, you know, their Amazon customer is the big thing. So you should have an obsession for customers. Uh, you should take ownership of the work you do. Uh, uh, you, know, you should invent and simplify, uh, which is very important. Uh, you should be right a lot. You can be wrong, but you should be more more times right than than, than wrong. Uh, you should be you should be curious and then learn. Uh, when you hire, you should know how to hire the best and also develop the best. Uh, uh, you should insist on the highest standards. You should do think big. Uh, you should have bias for action. You know, do something today. You don't don't leave it for tomorrow. To do, do, it, do it right away. Uh, you should practice frugality. Don't don't waste money. Uh, you should earn trust. Deep dive. And any of these things here, they can they can be enough to knock a can candidate out. I've seen candidates that in the technical part pass with flying colors, and then they get like a, so. And anyone who is interviewing at Amazon, I say that you, this is something that you should study. And there are lots of resources on the internet where you can read the types of questions that they ask. And, and when in interviewing people, I saw that a lot. A lot of people they they had studied this, this. They had studied because of the way that they answered the questions, so that they were they were, they were well prepared. But anyway, uh, now a new cycle is beginning for me. So as I said last year, I retired uh, after a little over eight years there. Uh, but I continue as an affiliate professor uh, at the University of Washington. And my new role now is a visiting professor. And so uh, in, last month, in February, I taught a month long graduate course uh, at ITA, is the Aeronautics Institute of Technology in Brazil. So the, it's located in the same city that Embraer is located. Uh, it's, it's one of the best universities, especially undergrad uh, studies, the guys who do engineering there, very strong. So I taught this course on data science and meta heuristics. And, uh, and now uh, this month I'm visiting uh, this university and next week Valencia. And I, I still plan to keep going to conferences. So I'm going to attend 
in May, the DIMAX workshop on vehicle routing implementation challenge, uh, which I, I was one of the organizers. And this is an implementation challenge that's been going on for uh, maybe five years. And, and because of COVID, we had to postpone the workshop. And now finally, we're going to have the, the in-person workshop uh, in New Jersey in May. I'll be at the i in Chile. I'll be, I'm planning to go to Informs in Arizona and the Brazilian OR conference uh, in uh, San Jose de Scomps. Uh, also, I'm joining an international advisory board at an univer Australian university, and I plan to travel there in September. Uh, this is in data, data science department. Uh, and I'm going to do research and write papers, give talks, collaborate with friends, and have fun, and also write, write this, this book. So uh, thanks very much for, for attending and for paying attention. And, and uh, if you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer.